God <laughs> would then take me on a journey to show me how he was the one who was going to fill all of those holes that I was filling with idols, mostly with men. <laughs> so, you know, after I had given that up, after I had given that guy up and I had grieved, I was like, Lord, I want you to be my comfort because I had a choice at that time. When I was grieving and really feeling the loss, I had a choice to run and turn to people to fill the holes or I could just, you know, pick myself up by my bootstraps and get over it or I could turn to God to be my comforter and that's when I really learned what it meant to have God be my comfort and I wanted to tell you that if you are mourning if you are grieving if you are sad Jesus Christ wants to be your comforter he wants to comfort you So the theme of this first segment is called Jesus Christ saves idolaters like me um, and you <laughs> and everyone. Um, so yeah, starting from the beginning, um, I remember when I was two years old, my mom took me to go see the Nutcracker. And at that point, I was like, so mom, when you signed me up? And I was a very, I knew what I wanted kind of kid, and so my mom went looking for a ballet studio and only one would take me because I was so young. And so I went to that ballet studio and I, like, was obsessed with ballet. Obsessed, completely. Like, dance was all that I knew. Um, and I remember uh, around the time when I was five, I was afraid of robbers coming in through my window and like snatching me or whatever. So I remember praying to God and be like, Lord, please save me and I'll give you my life. When I was five, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just afraid. And so, um, yeah, I remember after that being in ballet class and just being like, I'm going across the floor for Jesus and like dancing for Jesus. And, um, you know, eventually I got pretty good. And then I stopped dancing for Jesus and started dancing really for people to tell me how good I was. Um, like I weirdly lived for that. <laughs> um, so when it got time for me to go to college, I was going to dance. Like that was all I was going to do. I was actually um, going back and forth in my head between going to school for dance and trying to get into a company and just doing the professional dance thing. Um, I chose to go to school. And I tried out for like 15 different programs and I got into every single one. That's a lie, except for UCLA. So shout out to UCLA for being really hard to get into. <laughs> um, but I had like ridiculous grades, ridiculous extracurriculars, and I still didn't get in. Whatever. Um, but I decided to go to this one university because I... <laughs> was just like that and I was like nope I actually don't want to go to any of these I'm gonna to go to this other giant football party school because I want to and I'll just get into the program when I get there and so I did that and I came in undecided and then I tried out for the uh, dance major and I didn't get in and then I tried out again and I didn't get in again <laughs> and at that point I was like what is my life even I guess I'll just party all the time. Um, so that's what I did because there was nothing else to do. I mean, I mean, I'm sure, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of other things I could have been doing. Um, but when you lose a giant piece of your identity like that, it's just like, I don't know who I am. I need to numb the pain. Um, little did I know then that that was actually God taking me on a journey of letting go of my idols already um, just so that I would finally grab onto him. So if you are losing things that you love and you love Jesus, chances are it's all going to turn out for the better because you're going to get to know Jesus better 
from losing those things. So cheer up, buttercup. So really, after losing that huge chunk of myself, what I turned to was my looks. And that's what I focused on, was just looking hot all the time. That was my thing. You know, that was my religion, really, was I wanted to be the one that people notice when I came to the party. <laughs> that was my ambition in life. So, um, you know, at that point, dance had been my god. God and his mercy stripped it away from me. <laughs> and so I clung to myself to be my god. Um, and through that, you know, I loved, if I couldn't dance formally, then I was going to go dance in clubs. Like, that's just what I was going to do. Um, not like stripping or anything yet, but it would definitely get to the point where that was my ambition, was <laughs> I wanted to be a stripper. Um, a a go-go dancer, really. So, um, sorry, I'm sitting at like a really awkward angle in my car. Who knows? This is probably not the best way to do this, but this is how we're doing it. Um, so, yeah, and when you when you make looking a certain way so you can grab attention, your life, and you want to become really good at that, you get attention. And, you know, <laughs> that actually was what fed me, was attention. And so, honestly, if Instagram was as big as it was, like, I would be afraid for myself just because I was addicted to that attention, specifically male attention, male attention, sorry, um, that I really was putting myself out there, um, you know, sexually and just not wearing very <laughs> good things and not doing very proper things. Um, I just didn't value myself, um, and I valued the attention that I got more because I needed that to feel beautiful, and I needed that to feel like I had purpose. So the only thing that I would say on that is, ladies, look at what you're posting on Instagram and ask yourself why you're posting it and be so honest with yourself. Because if it's for the attention, if it's for the likes, and a lot of what I hear is, I do it for myself because I feel good when I do that. Like, okay, are you not pleased with yourself normally though? And if not, you know, if you don't think that you're desirable unless you're sticking your booty out for everyone to see, you know, unless you're looking fine that day, and trust me, I can relate. This was me. Okay? Uh, and I had to dig and dig and dig for this picture because I deleted all the pictures that I had because God led me to. He was like, you are idolizing that person and you need to let that person go. Because that's not who you are. That's the shell that you created for yourself. Um, if you don't feel beautiful without that, like I was addicted to fake tan, I was addicted to bleach blonding my hair, uh, makeup. I remember one day I had a literal panic attack at work because I woke up late, went to work without straightening my hair. God forbid. Now look at me, like my coworkers would be so proud to see me. Like, look at this. I just feel so free. Anyway, um, but I, I had to ask the bartender to watch the patio so that I could go home and straighten my hair. If that's not slavery, man, I don't know what is. So I'm, I'm just going to encourage you ladies to ask yourself, first look at what you're posting and then ask yourself why you're posting it. That's all I'm going to say there. I did. I got a lot of attention. And... um. At one point, I got the attention of this one guy who I then was like, okay, this guy is now my god. And I'm going to, everything that I do, 
everything that I think about, everything that I am is going to be for this guy. Um, and to basically just make him mine. Like how, it's just so, so sad and so twisted. Um, but that's what I did was I just lived for this guy. And the sad thing was nobody knew. Not even him. <laughs> because how traumatizing would that be to have your god not feel the same way about you? That would suck. So I just didn't risk it. So basically what I did was I seduced this guy. And, um, you know, I guess he seduced me in return. But long story short, this guy was god to me. He dictated my life because I wanted him to. Um, and that's no way to, to live, <laughs> honestly. And this whole time I thought I was a Christian because I grew up kind of Christian. You know, I knew do this, don't do that, but I didn't really know why. So when I got to college, it was like, well, why the heck not? <laughs> and I just did everything and went a little bit crazy. This guy, you know, he, he fulfilled a lot of things that, were empty in my heart. He made me feel beautiful. Um, just being with him made me feel beautiful. He made me feel powerful. He made me feel safe. He made me feel protected. And that's what I wanted out of life. That's what we all want out of life. Um, and the trap is to look for it in a person other than Jesus Christ because nobody is perfect. Nobody can hold the weight of that pressure when he couldn't hold the weight of that pressure, like, my world came crashing down. And I was not living a life where I could even demand that of him because I was sleeping around all over the place. But, you know, my heart was with this guy. Like, I remember the day that I decided that this was the guy for me forever only. Like, I will only ever love this guy. I screwed a lot of people over, <laughs> um, including myself. And so stuff went down. We kind of, stuff went down. I messed up big time. And because of that, I actually gave my life to Christ and became a Christian. And then I knew that I had to go to him and take responsibility for everything that I had did, had did, had done. Um, and I think that kind of behavior draws people, you know, when you can own your crap, like that is such an attractive thing. And so I knew that I had to do that. And I knew it was the end of my reputation. I knew it was the end of my relationship with him, you know, I was like, well, he's going to hate me and everything, but I have to say this. And so I did that and it actually ended up making him more drawn to me. But at that point I had become Christian and I knew that he was not. <laughs> he actually kind of hated God and was mad at him. Um, just, he thought he was a bully just because of suffering in the world. Um, I think he still thinks that, so if you're watching this, <laughs> you know who you are. I mean, I think you know who you are, but he's not a bully. He's not. When I got saved, that was the beginning of the process of God cleansing me of all of the mess and the dirt that I had dug myself into. And, you know, I remember the last time that I slept with that guy. I, I gave my life to Christ. I didn't really understand what that meant. Um, and I'll talk about that in a, that experience in a different video. Um, because no one really... I didn't have anyone around me discipling me or telling me the gospel. I just knew that I needed Jesus. And so... Um, yeah, so the last time that I slept with this guy... I remember the presence of God being in the, the corner of the room 
and him being there watching me and I knew that he loved me and I knew that he was not mad at me and he was he was like looking at me saying this isn't you you don't need to be doing this this isn't you and you know we had like taken the whole day off to just have sex all day and so at that point <laughs> it was pretty early on in the day and I was like ah, I don't feel good I have to go home made some stupid excuse and left because the conviction of the Holy Spirit was so heavy on me and no one told me Kylie you cannot have sex Kylie you shouldn't have sex and at this point I didn't have a Bible either I wasn't even reading a Bible um, it was just the Holy Spirit he's real He's real, and we can trust him with ourselves. We can trust him with each other. You know, the thing is, everyone's on a journey, and we have to be patient with one another. So when we come at people, which is what I started doing, actually, when I started reading the Bible, I was, like, coming at people, like, you can't be doing this, you can't be doing that. Anyway, um, but, so, so I went home. And I remember just some, some really demonic stuff was happening during this time. And again, I'll talk about that in a different video. But my dad had called me up. And he never called me because I, growing up, I hated my dad. Like, from the womb to the time I was saved. Hated the guy. For no reason. He's a great guy. He's like the most gentle, like, solid, loving guy. And I absolutely could not stand him. Um, so... My dad called me one week and was like, hey, how you doing? And at that point, I was like, well, I need to move back home to California. And so he was like, okay, great. I can be up there this weekend. Like, didn't ask questions, didn't do anything. And he, he came and helped me move. Um, and my, my brother helped me move, too. Um, and we took all my stuff down to my mom's house. Um in California and for five years I convinced myself that I was going to be single forever that I actually looked into being a nun for real and you know I'm not Catholic and I have tons of debt so I could never be a nun but and that's actually one of the things is they don't take you if you have debt and I have a lot so God has purpose in those student loans ladies <laughs> for real so um five years really I had convinced myself that I had let this guy go for five years and it's funny because every Christmas and every Thanksgiving I would go visit him and I would say that I was going to visit my friends and then I would ditch my friends to go see him and just spend like the whole time with him. And we weren't doing anything bad. You know, in my mind, I was like, I have to evangelize. Like, I have to save him. He has to be saved. Um, I can't tell you how many tears I cried and pray prayers I prayed for him, for that guy to be saved. Um, but it wasn't until five years later in 2015. Nope. I lied to you, 2018, because I got saved in 2013, um, baptized in 2013, and I had no idea what I was doing then. Um, it wasn't until 2018 when I knew that God was telling me that I had to let him go, and I was finally honest with myself that I had not. <laughs> you know, I had convinced myself that I had the gift of singleness, I didn't need to be with anyone to be happy, like God was all that I needed, and in reality, it was just because I had a soul tie that I didn't want to get rid of, um, and I'll, I'll probably talk a little bit more about that in a different video, but that soul tie was filling all those things that I, that I needed, and I remember one year, it was 2014, Christmas of 2014, I went and I visited him. And again, I, I had gone to Arizona and that's where I was. I had gone to Arizona, um, to be with my, my friend whose grandpa had just died. But really I went to go see this guy and I ditched her 
to go hang out with this guy, even though I said I was going to support her because her grand grandfather passed away. And she was someone that right when I got saved, I had been witnessing to and like bought her a Bible and all this stuff. And so, um, man, just looking back. Wow. Sorry, I'm just blown away at like how selfish I am. <laughs> it's horrible. Anyway, so, um, yeah, I remember the last time I went to go visit him. And we had gone to this club that we would usually go to. And mind you, I had been through a modesty journey. So I was like, I was wearing... I was wearing more modest clothes than I would have been previously, but still, like, if I had the opportunity to dance on a stage, like, best believe you found me dancing on a stage. Not anymore, but then, still, yes. Um, so, he, we, you know, he knew the DJ, and so we went up on stage, and I was dancing, and, um, I just remember being so awake and aware to the fact that when I was dancing on stage, I was under the spirit of seduction and it made me feel super powerful and that's why I did it. And you know, it's so intoxicating to have that power over people. I understand Satanism. <laughs> like, it seems like a funny jump to make, but power is very intoxicating very intoxicating and so I remember dancing on the stage the last time I visited him and basically seducing people in the audience even though like I, I was a Christian and I knew it was wrong and I could feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit as I was doing it but I didn't like it took a long time to, for my eyes to be open to Kylie you can't dance like that anymore Oh no, there's a bug in my car. Please exit. Please exit. Ah! Okay, I think it's gone. <laughs> it's one of those big, like, mosquito eaters that apparently are good and they eat mosquitoes, but they're really scary. So, okay. It's fine, I can cut that out. <laughs> um, so, anyways, dancing on stage, seducing guys in the audience. And I didn't want them to come up on stage, but one or two of them did. And I remember going and being next to the guy that I had come with and loving the feeling that I got from those guys not being able to have anything to do with me because I was with this other guy. I loved that. I loved having someone who wanted me and said no and would say no you can't have her she's mine like loved it loved it so sorry i'm just i'm a little overwhelmed by how sorry sometimes when i think about it i just get a little bit overwhelmed at how god is that for me now and how he wants to be that like if you have a desire go to the root of that desire it's probably a god-given desire god wants to fill that himself and he will if you just let go of everything else that you're getting that life from let go of your idols <laughs> let go of them and let God fill you. Let God be your God. He wants to be. <sighs> okay, so. Sorry, that might happen a lot. <laughs> you never know. Oh, mercy. Okay. So. And I remember the end of that night. It was that night or a different night. I don't, I don't quite remember. It's all a little hazy. But when he was walking me back to my car because I had I was visiting him he had walked me back to my car and while he was walking me back to my car there was like this tweaker guy out on the street it's like 4 a.m and 
he goes like this and he gets in front of me and puts me behind him as we're walking by this tweaker guy who's like cracking out and talking about how like I killed nine people with a knife and like he's like oh okay you know and puts me behind him and walks past and protected me and that just pulled on my heart so much and I was like man I love that he makes me feel protected and God was opening my eyes to this and showing me what I was getting from this guy and why I wouldn't let him go and I remember the last night that I saw him um I spent the night in his house um and you know nothing sexual or anything nothing like that because I had absolutely drawn the line at that I was like nope no way mm -mm, not even nope nothing um and I remember we were sleeping it was winter and we're in the desert so people in the desert can't really handle winter so I think the heat was on and in the middle of the night I woke up and I was so sweaty I was like I'm in hell I'm in hell I've made it to hell and I remember being like terrified and I woke up and he's next to me having like a night terror having a night terror and I knew that it was demonic like I could feel in my spirit that it was demonic and at that point I no longer felt safe with him because I used to have night terrors hardcore and I knew that the only thing that could stop those is Jesus Christ and I woke him up and I'm sure I looked creeped out um and he was like, I was just, I was just bound in my dream. I was just bound, bound up. And in my mind, I'm like, yes, you are spiritually bound. And Jesus is the only way to get free. And I just didn't know what to say at that time. I was like, oh. And so the next morning I woke up and I knew I had to let that guy go. I had to. Because he was in place of God to me and keep in mind this is five years after I'm saved like five years after I see Jesus do crazy things for me so it really is a miracle an act of God when we do let go of our idols and so I was in the airport to leave to go fly back to where I lived and um because i i lived back in north carolina so um i was at the airport and he sent me a text message saying i wish that i had married you and everything in me my flesh was screaming to take me back to this guy I wanted to be with him so bad but I knew at that point I had to make a choice and it was either this guy or God and by faith I chose to believe that God was going to be better than anything that this guy could give me and I <laughs> had to explain that <laughs> like I explained it in the most loving way possible that I could that I could because he didn't understand why we couldn't be together and I was like you don't love God and Jesus is my life <laughs> like he's not part of my life he's like not some fun thing that I do sometimes he is my life and I remember letting him go <laughs> I remember actually the night that I did, I was laying on my friend's couch <laughs> and I don't know how, can't explain to you how. And that's the thing with forgiveness and with soul ties and with all these different things. People ask a lot, like, how do you let that go? I can't tell you. God has to show you. You have to get on your face and seek God. So, and it's different for everyone. Sometimes it's fasting. Sometimes it's lots of prayer. Sometimes you just ask and it's gone. You know, it's different for everyone. So 
If you don't know how to let go, but you know you have to, press in. Get in the prayer closet. Get to know God. And just an aside, sorry for the lighting, you guys. I obviously am a noob, and this is, like, my first time editing and realizing that, like, sunshine changes over time. Um, but how you, like, how I knew that I had really let go was, you know, I'd be scrolling in Facebook and I'd come across something that he had posted, and I didn't feel any need to read it. I was just like, hmm. He was just like every other person at that point. And, like, the connection was gone. <laughs> it was so crazy. It was just like, oh, he's just some other, he's just another guy. And then, honestly, like, now where I am, I'm like, I'm not even really attracted to you anymore. Like, yeah, you're a cool guy. And I, I, God has refined my desires. So, um, just know that when you have truly let go of someone, there will be fruit from that. So you don't have to guess like, have I let him go? Have I not? Blah, blah, blah. You'll know. Um, so just had to put that in there. And that's something else that he's taught me through letting go of, like, all those gazillions of soul ties that I've had is um, going through tough stuff like that with God draws you closer together and bonds you guys in friendship and in love. Like, you get to see him come through for you. So all the bad stuff that we go through is actually good stuff and that's why we can count it all joy because all the soul ties all these nasty things that we get involved with god uses those for his glory so yeah i remember and i remember letting go of him and the next day not being happy not being filled with joy not being you know, filled with the joy of the Lord at all. I was actually sad, like very sad and very upset. And I remember talking to my one friend and telling her the whole story. And she was like, oh, well, maybe you're grieving. And I was like, that's weak and pathetic. Nope, not me. And then I was talking through it with my pastor's wife. And she was like, oh, I think you're grieving. And I was like, Ugh, why does everyone keep saying that? I am not grieving. And then I took it to the Lord and he was like, Kyle, you're grieving. And you need to grieve it and then you need to be done with it. So I did. <laughs> and that's where things got really wacko psycho because God... <laughs> would then take me on a journey to show me how he was the one who was going to fill all of those holes that I was filling with idols, mostly with men. <laughs> so, you know, after I had given that up, after I had given that guy up and I had grieved, I was like, Lord, I want you to be my comfort because I had a choice at that time when I was grieving and really feeling the loss. I had a choice to, run and turn to people to fill the holes or I could just you know pick myself up by my bootstraps and get over it or I could turn to God to be my comforter and that's when I really learned what it meant to have God be my comfort and I wanted to tell you that if you are mourning if you are grieving if you are sad Jesus Christ wants to be your comforter. He wants to comfort you. And we turn to all of these different things and it's like we cheat ourselves. Like Jesus died to buy us life and life more abundantly. And knowing him as the comforter is part of that. <laughs> like we have unlimited ultimate comfort so accessible to us. All we have to do is ask and let go of everything else. So, yeah, that's how I, I got to know God as my comfort. But 
you know, after that, I went like boy crazy. And I had never really been like that in high school. Um, and in college, you know, I was just that one boy crazy. I was just crazy for that one guy and everyone else was just like some weird thing that I used to get what I want. Um, but I went like absolutely boy crazy. And it was so good for me because I would look down on people like who had crushes and were super boy crazy and I'd be like, oh, that's cute, but you're weak and pathetic. And now here I, here I was. Everything that I looked down on. <laughs> oh, God is so good. God is so good because that's exactly what I needed. And sorry, you guys, my legs are falling asleep. Yikes. Uh, maybe I'll get better at this later, but for now, this is, this is just what you get. Um, I'm just trying to be obedient, so here I am. So I think that might be a sign that I should stop this first episode here. Um, but, man. An idol isn't just a wooden statue that you bow down to. An idol is where you get your life from. Where do you get your life? Is it from attention? Is it from how smart you are? Is it from men? Is it from ice cream? Went through that phase for a little bit. Um, where do you get your life from? And whatever your answer to that is, that's your idol. Um, because if the answer is not Jesus Christ, you are selling yourself so short. And just know, all those desires that you have, again, Jesus Christ wants to fill. He wants to be your life. So, that's just a little episode of how Jesus Christ saves idolaters like me. Um... You know, even though we chase after gods other than him, he still saves us. That, that just blows my mind. It just, the story of Hosea becomes so poignant. That God was like, okay, Hosea, your life is going to be a sign. And I want you to act this out so people can see how I love them. And that's what we are. We're all a bunch of gomers running around, prostituting ourselves with idols. And God wants to cleanse us of that. Just know there's a deeper relationship available with God than what you have right now. The reason why I can say that with surety is because there's always deeper relationship available with God. Because <laughs> he's endless. And that's I, I believe that's seriously what heaven is going to be. Because Jesus says that heaven is, you know, to know God and to know Jesus Christ whom he, ha whom he has sent. And so heaven is just going to be getting to know God more and more and more and more and being so blown away by who he is more and more and more and more. Um, so however much you know God now, you can know him more. And he wants you to know him more. So find what you're holding on to and let that stuff go. Let it go. That's the part that feels like dying. You know, when the Bible says die to yourself daily. Like when you give up something that you're getting life from, that feels like death. It's horrible. But you have to do it in order to grab a hold of Christ. And be filled by Christ. So, yeah, I guess that's what I would encourage you with is even if you have latched on to these other things and you are getting your life from something else, Jesus still wants you. He still wants you. So find what you're holding on to instead of Him and let it go. Because Jesus Christ saves idolaters like you and like me.